Well, it's great to be with you guys. Some of you don't look too happy about it. You can <laughs> smile. <laughs> God's here. Come on. Um, doing some training for counties on uh, Tuesday this week about uh, children's work and schools work. And I just was minded to mention, listen, if any of you um, feel the calling if, to find out more about evangelism, uh, counties does training. And there's a, a three different strands of training. Um, there's a, a one-year course for 16 to 25-year-olds who want personal, uh, who want training, sorry, 18 to 25-year-olds who want to train um, and find out about evangelism. It's not about, it's not full-time course. It's bits you plug into over the space of a year. Um, there's a more intense course for anyone thinking of full-time work as an evangelism, uh, as an evangelist. And then there's um, a course for younger folk um, over two years, personal development and leadership training. So think about training. Uh, the beauty of training with counties is you don't have to trot off to some Bible college and do a lot of theory and pay a lot of money for it. Um, it is incredibly cheap uh, and um, it is practical, hands-on stuff, yes? Evangelist, gift of evangelist is caught, not taught, guys, yes? Yeah. So if you're thinking about evangelism, you just want to be more effective in the church or, or something more serious, um, I've got a little leaflet here. Grab one from me. Um, thank you for guys who, for you who pray for us, um, Sue and I. Um, somebody asked this morning, am I still at Mia? No, I'm not still at Mia. Um, basically, it got to uh, just before the summer holiday last year, and I realized that I'd achieved all the objectives that I set out for to turn the church around at Mir. The building had been renovated, we got a congregation, we got new leadership team, and um, the village is now coming to the church um, because like, it's the only decent building to do, have a meeting in in Mir. So things are taking off nicely at Mir. I realized it was job done. Where would I go to church, I thought? And I'd started going to this little chapel at Henley, um, not Henley-on-Thames, no, um, it's somewhere near Langport, absolutely in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I'm in membership at Henley and on the leadership team, and God is doing stuff at Henley. It's a tiny little chapel in a tiny little place, but God doesn't want these little village chapels to close, you know. They can be a beacon of light. And the um, first time I rolled up at Henley, I'd never been there before, um, and there's a link between Mir and Henley, which is nice. And, and I thought, I know, what was I expecting? I don't know, Dusty Village Chapel, do you know? And I had a sermon in my pocket. And even as I'm parking the car, the Lord says, no, nope, not that sermon. No, no, I want you to preach on this Bible verse. Uh, any of you are preachers, this isn't a good moment, is it? You know, you've got like 20 minutes to think of a new sermon, you know. Okay, Lord, what do you want me to say? I'm saying as I'm going to the church and the worship group is just warming up. And, 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 and the next two times I preached there, the Lord did the same thing. And then in the worship, I realised I need a hanky if I'm going to go to Henley because the Holy Spirit is falling on me as we worship together. And they've allowed me to be part of the worship group now, which is nice. And... And at, what's the plan at Henley then? Well, it's different than Mir. Mir, I told them I've no idea what I'm doing, but you know, the plan is I haven't got a plan. I've got less of a plan at Henley because the plan is this, the Holy Spirit is falling upon us. And I think he's gonna fall upon us. In fact, I'm sure he's gonna fall upon us big time. And that's the plan. It's great, isn't it? It's great. Because when the Holy Spirit, think about the Welsh Revival. What, any of you read about the Welsh Revival? What happened there? Was there a plan? No. There was a young man who God had stirred up to pray and expect revival. That was enough. Oh, that there was someone in this church with the same vision here. Yeah? Don't you want the Holy Spirit just to fall? Don't they, don't they preachers even? The preachers, the story, the heaven, oh never mind, I'm not going to talk about the worst revival. We need that, don't we? Lord, let's just pray. Lord, we're thinking about Jacob's final words today. 
May they be your words for us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, bit of a long reading, so I'm going to edit it down. Um, it's in Genesis chapter 49. We'll start at verse 1, and then you'll get the hits and highlights. If you got that, yep, you got All right, keep up. Thank you. <laughs> then Jacob called for his sons and said, gather round, so I can tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. Assemble and listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honour, excelling in power. Turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel. For you went up onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and defiled it. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son, like a lion. He crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nation shall be. There we are. Jacob's talking about Jesus. Isn't that amazing? And the obedience of the nation shall be his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. And then I will skip a few sons. Let's get on to Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall and with bitterness archers attacked him and they shot at him with hostility but his bow remained steady, his strong arm stayed limber because, because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you with the blessings of the skies above, the blessings of the deep springs below, blessings of the breast and womb. Your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, than the bounty of the age-old hills. Let all the rest of the head of Joseph let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. <clears throat> all these are the twelve tribes of Israel. And this is what their father said to them when he blessed them, giving each the blessing appropriate to him. And when Jacob finished giving his instructions to his sons, he drew his feet up onto his bread, bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. What an ending, eh? Now, 12 sons of Jacob, the descendants of each son will become a tribe in Israel. So the blessings of Jacob are not just about the sons before him, as he reached out his arms and blessed each one. They are a prophecy, aren't they? About the destiny of the descendants and the two are linked the actions of the son here and now and the consequences for future generations that's kind of mind-blowing isn't it listen you may think your life is in a little bubble that's that's what the me generation says isn't it? it's all about me never mind anybody else but what you and I do, for good or ill, e even as the sons of Jacob, has ripples down through the generations. It affects whether you walk with Jesus or whether you walk without him, whether you live for Jesus or you live for yourself. The ripples go out. Your children and your children's children will be touched by the consequence of your witness here and today. And that is a mind-blowing and solemn thought for every single one of us. And that is why the words of Jacob really matter to each one of us this morning. 
What witness am I? We should be asking ourselves. And maybe some of us need to wake up and smell the coffee this morning and be different after this service. Judah was praised. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. The name Judah means praise. And Judah is praised. From the name of Judah comes Judea, the name of God's chosen people, Jew. Yeah? So the land and the people, the very names come from the name of Judah, and it means praise. And Judah's getting a well done from his dad. Well, that's good, isn't it? Even better to get a well done from our heavenly dad, yes? I went to the funeral of County's evangelist Ivor Cooper recently. Ivor's been a, a good friend and good colleague, and it was sad to have to go to his funeral, frankly. But what a funeral. What a funeral. It's a picture of Ivor somewhere. Let's have him. Yes, him. What a funeral. What did Ivor do then as a county's evangelist? Well, the church was packed. It was a big church. The overflow was packed. There were people standing around the edges. It was packed. The funeral was absolutely packed. Why? Because of all the lives he touched. <laughs> in his ministry and in his life, there were the members of the churches he planted. Churches, plural. There were the lives that he had touched in the camps that he had run and in the missions that he had run, all the people that were saved. He was the creative driving force in just about every county's resource that there has been since I've been in counties. Jesus' life, life his, his creativity shaped these tools that were used by thousands and thousands to hear about Jesus. Each of his grandchildren were there and they spoke of their granddad and their granddad's witness. It was just amazing to be there and to hear a counting of such a life, such a remarkable life. And I will miss him. But boy, is he hearing the master's well done right now. Yes? And that's what matters. Jesus gave a parable that is an echo for you and for me when the faithful servant hears from the master these words, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share with your master's happiness. What do you want most of all in this life? What do you think about most of all? What is your aim? What is your goal? What is, why are you here? Is it more than anything else? more than anything we could own, more than any status we could achieve, more than anything else, is it just to hear these words from our Father God as we enter into glory, well done, good and faithful servant. Is it this? If it is, it changes everything, doesn't it? Instead of holding on to stuff, we are releasing it into his service. Our time, our ambitions, our gifts, our goal. Well done, good and faithful servant. Judah was praised. Don't you want that praise? And what monument do we seek? What memorial do we want 
to leave. There's a memorial in Wales to Evan Roberts, who was the key player in the Welsh Revival, a young man, an absolute nobody. He came from the coal mines for crying out loud. He was a total nobody in the eyes of the world, but it was upon that young man that God's Holy Spirit rested. That's a glorious, glorious story of um, one typical night in the Welsh Revival. A family, coal miners, guy comes home from the pits, scoops together his wife and children. We're going to chapel. Evan Roberts is coming. And they go to chapel with the children. And the place is already packed. I mean, seriously packed. Can't get in the door packed. But they see the family roll up and the folk take pity and somehow room is found. And this is the, what he saw. So then Evan Roberts arrives. The place is packed, packed, packed. So packed that Evan's thinking, how am I going to get to the pulpit? He climbs over the heads of the people. Crawls up, couldn't be very dignified, crawls out the front of the pulpit. So he's in the pulpit. What's Evan Roberts going to say? What's the great preacher going to say? He says in Welsh, of course, let us pray. That's all he said. The fire fell. <laughs> People confessed Jesus. People were saved. But the fire fell. There was singing. There was, there was, he didn't have to say, it went on for hours. In the end, he climbed back over the heads of the people and went on somewhere else. Do you know how many people were saved in the Welsh Revival? Evan prayed for 100,000. It was way more than that in a space of a year. They wondered what to do with the police. There wasn't any crime anymore. The courts would meet, but they had nothing to do. Terrible time to be a publican, of course. <laughs> Don't you want to see that? Don't you hunger for that? Do you, do you pray for that here? And then there was Reuben. What do we read about Reuben? In the Bible we read, Reuben went in and he slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah, and Israel heard about it. That's what Reuben did, the firstborn. So on the de his deathbed, Joseph, sorry, Jacob pronounces this awful judgment. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power, turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel. For you went up on your father's bed onto my couch and defiled it. The firstborn should have had the first place, right? But he threw it away. And instead, his tribe became an unimportant half-tribe. No special honour there. I wonder, are we throwing away the good things God has given us through sheer lack of judgment and lack of character? Let me tell you about a grandmother's curse. Lovely had told me this story. So his wife died quite young. And the grandmother said, OK, I'll change my will. And left all the money to the only surviving relative, his son, her grandson. And then she died unexpectedly. And so at the age of, I don't know, 18, he was left a huge amount of money. Enough money to pay for his tuition fees and help him buy a house one day, yes? Wonderful, you think. Not wonderful at all because the young man entirely lacked judgment. And he blew it all in the space of a couple of years in every unsuitable way you could possibly imagine until the grandmother's curse, that's what his dad called it, was finally all gone. And you and I can be just as stupid, can't we? 
because Satan is not our friend. How many lives have been destroyed like Reuben's because of sexual sin? How many inspiring Christian ministries have so publicly fallen apart because of sexual sin? Peter warns us, be alert and of sober mind. Why? For your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He is not your friend. Satan is not your friend. He whispers in your ear all the time, but he is not your friend. He calls you to compromise. Oh, it's just a little thing, he says. It's not a little thing. He is not your friend. If if you think you are standing firm, the Bible warns us, be careful then that you don't fall. When I started Christian ministry, I was blessed with being part of a wonderful church leadership team. And Ivor Harris, with the Lord now, once said these words to me, I will never see a woman on my own. Never see a woman, if you are a man, on your own. When I was at Moreland's, I had a wonderful term shadowing a full-time Christian worker. Gifted man, a good man. It was a really fruitful, helpful experience for me. But he was doing pastoral work, right? And I, one day a week, I would go and shadow him. And what he would do is he would visit a home and then another home and another home. And he would spend about an hour. And it was it was really good. Seriously, way better than me, my goodness. And he would, you know, would chat and, and, and bring words of encouragement from Scripture and pray, and then he'd go, yes, it was amazing watching him. But as I reflect, this was not amazing. He was a young man, and he was mostly visiting women on their own. My friends, that is a recipe for disaster. And my old elder Ivor would never do such a thing because it's asking for trouble. If you think you are standing firm, be careful. I have seen so many Wonderful church leaders fall because of such temptations. I could rattle you off a list of names, but I shan't. Some of them are quite near home. Be very careful. Can I show you probably the biggest problem that there is right now? Any of you looking at your curse? This thing. Watch your life. Well, watch what you watch. Because for so many, I think a lot more than they're letting on, this thing is a curse and a snare. And I ask you, what did Jesus say about things that were a snare? He said, cut it off. If it's an eye, pluck it out. If it's a hand, chop it off. Because it's better to enter life without that thing than hell keeping it. If this is a problem to you, get rid of it. I'm serious. And what about Joseph? And the name Joseph means God shall add. And Joseph's tribe will grow to be prosperous. And Joseph is the stark opposite of Reuben. What do we read? Now, Joseph was well built and handsome, the scripture says. And after a while, while he was a slave in his master's house, 
After a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, look at that. He refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. She propositioned him day after day. Day after day, she said, nobody will know, didn't she? Just between us. Anybody read this book? Dobson's book, Love Must Be Tough. Anybody read it? One has. I would recommend you all to read it. I've got loads of Jobson's books. He's been a prolific writer, isn't he? And my kids were brought up on his, the principles in his books. But I think this is his finest. I had to use it just recently. I gave it to somebody whose spouse was having an affair. because it was written particularly for that. It touches all kinds of things. What do you do? How do you get your head straight when you're in such confusion? How do you treat that other person? And it really helped, as I knew it would. And they did the things that recommended in the book. And what things does that book talk about? It talks about the nature of temptation. And it says, look, somebody doesn't have an affair suddenly. No, this thing has a long tail. You usually got months. It usually starts with a word or a look or a text, message, you know, WhatsApp. I know, doesn't it? It starts with a little thing. And the... Uh, word is returned and the look is returned and the, you know and and each time the person does this thing and then they retreat back to safety yes and then there's another and then there's another and then and it has a long tail so you can stop it if you nip it in the bud but you don't stop it and you don't nip it in the bud and it builds up and it builds up until it is that full-blown affair and the family is destroyed and the kids' lives are messed up and the home is split up and sold. And yes, and all the disaster and the hurt that follows on because sin, the whole point of sin is that it hurts innocent parties. Every sin hurts an innocent party somewhere. What wickedness, what selfishness. Joseph wouldn't, even though it cost him dear, Joseph wouldn't go down that road or even be with her. Reuben was the other thing. Not Reuben. <laughs> Losing track of my brothers now. Never mind. Judah. Let's see. Then what's Reuben? Um, so, coming back to your phone, if you look at an unhelpful thing, the algorithm will send it to you again, won't it? And it will feed you that thing, and it will feed you that thing. So which do you want to be? Reuben or Joseph? For the sake of your family, which do you want to be? And yes, I do recommend the book. 
Love must be tough. The fruit of the Spirit, my friends, is love, it's joy, it's peace, it's forbearance, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, and it is self-control. Self-control. Joseph had it, Reuben did not. Every winter, and I will finish with this, I prune my orchard, yeah? I get out the saw and the secateurs and the dead and the diseased and the dying are cut out because I want my, autumn, my orchard to be fruitful and it has to be pruned if it's going to be fruitful. And you and I, almighty God, would prune us today. And he would take out the pruning shears of the Holy Spirit and cut things out of our lives that should not be. Are you serious with God? Then be serious about this. May self-control grow out in all of our lives that we may know in greater fullness the joy of the Lord. Judah's praise, Reuben's shame, Joseph's fruitfulness and self-control, which will we choose? May the Lord help us to do right. Amen.